flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above heaven and earth. He raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithfulness. For the people of Israel who are close to him, praise the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we have gathered today to praise you, to reorient ourselves on who you are and who you've called us to be, uh, to put you in your rightful place as first above all. Lord, we are often struck by the beauty of your creation, uh, both here that we see in the areas that we live and as we get to travel around and see the wonders that you have made, you are a great and awesome God. And we want to lift our voices with the voices of all creation, praising you for who you are and inviting you to be with us in this service this morning. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen and amen. I invite you to stand as we join our songs to the songs of creation. Good morning. It is Hymnal Sunday. Grab your hymnal before you stand up. Turn to page 75 and we'll begin with This Is My Father's World. Again, page 75. <clears throat> Day by day, let's do all three verses, please. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure. Mingling toil with peace and rest. Every day the Lord Himself is near me with 
the special mercy for each eye. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power, the protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he days thy strength shall be in measure this a pledge to me help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises O Lord not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand, one by one the days of moments fleeting. Till I reach the promised land. All right, and if you'll turn over to page 92, we'll do God Leads Us Along, all four verses. shady green pastures so rich and so sweet God leads his dear children along where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet God leads his dear children Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all. the 
leads his dear children Let's pray this morning. Our great and gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your watch care, your protection, and your leading. Lord, we often feel like we're wandering around uh, in the world. Many, For many of us, the signposts that we're used to seeing are no longer there. We feel distressed by the way that things are going, the way that things are so different, and if we are simply left to our own devices and our own visions, we would very easily be tempted to frustration, confusion, or despair. But we know, Lord, that you are God, that this is your world, and that even if it seems that the wrong is off so strong, you are still the ruler yet, and that even though we may not be able to see or even imagine the kinds of good things that you are going to be bringing out of the struggles that we encounter, we don't have to. We only need to trust that you do and put our hands in yours. So Lord, we pray, especially during these days and these moments, that you would just give us that grace to allow us to trust you. Forgive us when we get frustrated by that and pull our hand away and try to make our own way. Forgive us when we demand answers, maybe to things that we just can't even understand. Forgive us when we doubt you and wonder if you really are going to be able to make something out of all this mess. And Lord, just teach us how to trust. Teach us how to follow you patiently. Teach us how to wait when that's what we need to do. Teach us to respond in grace and love and mercy when you present those opportunities in front of us for your kingdom of light to go forward in these times of darkness. Lord, more than anything else, we just want to be a part of that redemptive process. We want to be a part of your light, especially when things feel so dark. So be with your people, Lord. Be with your family. Be with your children as we are trying to live for you in this world. And Lord, because we trust you, because we know that you are God, and that we are not, we can bring our prayers and our petitions to you. We can lay them at your feet. Yes, Lord, we are always tempted to pick them back up again and worry and fret on them, but then just invite us to lay them back down again and to trust that you are working to, be, to bring all things to good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So, Lord, we would bring to you those thoughts and concerns that we have we think especially, Lord, of those who are struggling in physical ways these days. Lord, we pray that you'd be with Brenda today. Um, just we pray that you would be touching her body, that you would be working uh, to heal these uh, lung issues that she's been having, uh, that you would be giving her strength and upholding her, helping her spirit to be up. Lord, be with the doctors and nurses in those ways that you choose to work through your human agents. But also, Lord, we pray that you would be working directly in her life in powerful healing ways. Be with those others, Lord, that we know that are still in the midst of healing journeys, Lord. Uh, we thank you for what you've done so far and are trusting you to keep it moving, uh, even though it often seems slower than we wish. But we pray that you'd be with Cindy and Barbara and Ben and Dolores. Pray that you continue to be with Mike uh, on his healing journey. Uh, just be with all of them, Lord. Give them strength in their bodies. Be healing them. 
and give them strength in their spirit, that even as they are walking through these valleys, uh, your love and your light uh, would shine through even in the darker times, as it did most especially on Calvary, your darkest time. Lord, we pray that you would be with those others that we know that are struggling with different kinds of things, uh, different kinds of oppressions or bindings, sometimes they're financial, sometimes they're circumstantial. Uh, Lord, we get caught up in so many different things and get ourselves stuck in so many different ways. But you are always there to give us a hand out. You are always there to rescue us and to lead us forward. Pray with those. Pray for those who are um, de- dealing with financial difficulties, Lord, that you would just, um, like you did with that widow, make the crews of oil multiply and make the ends stretch until they meet. Pray would you would be with those who are struggling in relational ways, Lord, uh, when things just aren't right and are unsettled, and we pray that your healing and forgiveness would flow through their lives. Pray for those that we know that are struggling uh, with circumstances and addictions and depressions and anxieties and all of those kinds of things that seem to come so easily in our world. Pray that you would just give us the power to be overcoming them through your spirit, uh, that we would learn that in you all things are possible, even if we also recognize that in ourselves nothing is. And as we turn to your scripture, Lord, we pray that you would be teaching us through it. Lord, we pray that you would give us those glimpses of your kingdom and what you are doing that would empower us to live here and now for you in these days. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen and amen. We don't like waiting, do we? It's uncomfortable, especially when you don't expect it, right? That here I am getting up and you're expecting me to start preaching a sermon and nothing happens. And you're like, what? What's going on here? What am I missing? What are we doing? Waiting. Not even sure for what. And we don't, we don't like it. <laughs> it makes us uncomfortable. Some of us begin to giggle. We don't like the silence. Waiting is hard for us. And of course, that's exactly what I was doing, was starting by preaching my sermon in silence and reminding us exactly how we feel about those times of waiting. We don't don't like it. It's no fun for us. We live in an age of immediacy. We live in an age where we have, you know, microwaves and instant streaming and anything that you want to learn at the touch of a button. Waiting has become very, very hard for us. And it's worse when you don't know it's coming. When you have to wait unexpectedly, those frustrations begin to build up. I I remember the first few months, really, that I was making my commute from Key Largo, where I live, down to Marathon, where I teach. Um, Going down in the morning is fine, because nobody's on the road at 5.30 in the morning, but coming home um, was often a bit of a struggle uh, for me, especially on a Friday, uh, when, you know, there's a whole lot of traffic. And I remember how frustrated I would get when I would get behind that slow truck get behind that really long line of cars. I just want to get home. I've been teaching all day. I'm tired. My brain is done. Can we just get there already? And remembering just how frustrated I would get time and time again when I ended up waiting until finally it dawned on me, you're just going to (laughs) wait. Your commute home is going to be half an hour to 45 minutes longer than your commute to work. That's just the way that traffic works in the Keys when you've only got two lanes and there's no side roads at all of any kind. The alternate routes are all very, very wet. (laughs) And once I figured that out and got accustomed to waiting, 
then it became a lot easier for me. Then I you, you usually, especially if the weather was nice, I'd have the top down on my convertible and I'd have whatever music, you know, playing and, you know, I'd be stuck and I'd be looking at the beautiful palm trees and all the green and a couple of those places where the ocean is right there next to you and you can see it and the waves and the turtles and it's not so bad. The, the thing about waiting is that we have to kind of get ready for it. Now, we don't want it to happen, but if we expect that there could be some delays, we tend to handle it a little bit better. And in fact, it may even be wise of us to anticipate those kinds of things because we will find that we will be much better suited to moving forward. Um, these past few months, we have been exploring the Gospel of Matthew, learning about the life of Jesus um, and how it is that he's inviting us to follow him. Particularly in these last few weeks, we've been talking about parables of the kingdom. Jesus has been telling stories to illustrate particular dynamics of this new reality that God is bringing forth, beginning with the life of Jesus and following into the lives of all of his followers. We're going to be finishing that up over the next three weeks with the three parables that Matthew has in Matthew 25. Three glimpses of the kingdom, all very different, but still a uh, common thread. Um, then we will have Pentecost on the 19th, and then we'll turn to something else uh, for our summer months. But if you have a Bible and would like to turn with me, I'm going to be at the very beginning of Matthew 25. And you will see that the point of this particular parable is about how we wait. Now, Jesus had been teaching uh, up to this point. This is a, a, a parable in the middle of a long discourse that he had been giving. And the immediate parable before that was also a parable about waiting. The master puts his servant in charge of things and then goes away. And in that particular parable, at the end of Matthew 24, um, the the slave begins to think, oh, the master's delayed. He, I, I can do kind of whatever I want, begins to mistreat and misuse the, past, the master's property. And so when the master comes back unexpectedly, he's caught off guard and he is punished uh, because he had taken advantage of the delay to not be a faithful steward. And so God had, uh, Jesus had already sort of dealt with that malfunctional approach to waiting. But he has another concern about waiting for the kingdom that he shares in this story he tells in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, beginning with the first verse, Jesus tells this story. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were prudent. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all of the bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there won't be enough for you and for us. You would better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Very often when we're thinking about the advent of the kingdom and the work of God in doing the kingdom, we do tend to think in very big ticket terms. We tend to think of whatever God is going to do for the epic end of history, second coming, rapture, all of those kinds of things. And so when we think in that way about the coming of the kingdom, it's very often that we will remind each other to you know, be ready. Because it's like the kingdom could break in at any given moment. And that is certainly the point that Jesus was making about the coming of the kingdom in the previous parable. In the previous parable, the idea of watching and waiting was that sense of, you know, don't, don't be caught 
doing what you're not supposed to be. be. Be caught doing the right thing because at any moment, at any moment, the kingdom of God could break in. And that is half of the truth about the coming of the kingdom that Jesus wants us to understand. But the other half is that, well, it, it hasn't happened yet. And it might not happen tomorrow or next week or five years from now or 15 years from now or 150 years from now. When we say that we really don't know when that will happen, that both invites us to be ready now, but also to be ready to be ready then. What are we being ready now? also means being ready to be ready then. What if we have to wait? What if there's a delay? More than the 2,000 year delay we already have. So when Jesus is teaching his disciples and trying to get them to think about readiness for the kingdom, that's his main point in this second parable. Ready to be ready. So again, you have a bridegroom. Um, some manuscripts add uh, and the bride. Um, probably that was just somebody writing in on the later thing because it seemed confusing why these bridesmaids would be waiting for the bridegroom. Um, probably it's because the way that ordinary um, Jewish weddings would have uh, been conducted, it is only the bridegroom and his entourage that would parade through the city getting to the place where the wedding was going to be held. The bride is already there. <laughs> we do um, the opposite in our uh, wedding traditions. Uh, the groom is the one standing at the altar. It is the bride uh, that comes marching in to Wendell's, Mendelssohn's wedding march and uh, Wagner's bridal chorus and all of that kind of stuff that we associate. So that's probably what the case is. This is going to be one of those big celebratory things. Um, other people had been invited to the wedding. Um, and so they are getting ready. They know that the bridegroom is coming. And Jesus characterizes these groups into two different people. Um, and he uses uh, the words that many of your translations will say foolish and wise. Um, the word for foolish uh, is one that you will recognize. Uh, it's the word moron. <laughs> We just bring that one right over into English. Uh, so Jesus talks about half of them are morons. Um, the other half, um, wise is probably not the right word to use for the way that Jesus describes them. Uh, the Bible has a word for wise, but it has a very strong moral connotation. The word, when you talk about wisdom, the word in the Bible is sophia. You've heard that word before. When you talk about wisdom, it's irreducibly moral. To be wise is to be a part of God's big ticket uh, processes in the world. And you can't get away with the, you can't, you know, abstract the word wise from the moral quantity. For example, um, it would be absolutely impossible for someone to wisely rob a bank. You can't wisely murder somebody. That, that doesn't make any sense. You might be able to do it cleverly. You might be able to do it prudently or shrewdly. But you're not going to do it wisely. Well, it's that clever, prudent, shrewd word that Jesus uses here, not the moral word for wise. So some of them are morons, and the others are shrewd. Um, they know the score, they know how it works, um, and they are ready to engage those. So Jesus is deliberately taking any sort of moral implications out of this. You have people who have no clue how things work, and they're just sort of blundering around, and they're the morons. <laughs> and then you have people who get it, and because they get it, they're ready and prepared for all eventualities. And the way that that works out in the parable is your anticipation of how long you may have to wait. The way that it works out in the parable is your anticipation for how long you are having to wait. All of them had lamps. But the morons only brought the lamps good enough, you know, with enough oil to last them for, eh, you know, a couple of hours. I mean, they're coming anyway, right? And of course, you might be able to spin this in some interesting ways. I mean, we just, we have faith that the bridegroom is coming. And so we know that he's going to just show up uh, on time. Um, but Jesus doesn't describe these as sort of faithful trusting acts. He describes them as moronic ones, foolish ones. 
They weren't ready for the unanticipated delay. They were just doing the immediate thing. All right, let's go. We got our lamps. Let's go. But the shrewd ones, they knew that mm, you can't always tell. So they brought extra flasks of oil with them. The only reason for that is possible delay. Do they know it's going to be delayed? Absolutely not. Do they hope that it's going to be delayed? Probably not. But just in case we have to wait, we're ready to be ready whenever the bridegroom does show up. And of course, if there's a delay. The bridegroom doesn't come at the beginning of the evening when they expect him to. And they're sitting there and waiting, and he's not here yet. He's not here yet. He's not here yet. And it's dark outside, and we're waiting. And you all know what it's like to wait when you're tired. <laughs> and very easily and naturally, all of them. The wise, the shrewd. And the foolish, they all fall asleep. Just too much, too long, too much waiting. And then at midnight, there's a call that goes out. All right, bridegroom's finally coming. Who knows, maybe his tailor was late and he didn't get his bridal outfit ready. You know, maybe he wouldn't, the, the bachelor party went a little longer than we anticipated. Yeah, we don't know. It doesn't explain it, doesn't matter. Like all of Jesus' parables, we only get the details that matter. The point is simply the delay. And so they get up, and they get their lamps ready. Um, they, 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 they make them right. Uh, so probably with a lamp, that means uh, trimming the wick or something like that. Um, and, of course, all of their lamps are sputtering. It's been hours. Um, those little lamps, you've seen those you know, typical Middle Eastern oil lamps and the way that they work. They only have a certain amount of oil in them. And so at that moment, all of the lamps are sputting, sputtering, and none of them are ready to be navigating dark streets of a city where there are no street lights, where who knows could be hiding in the corner. So none of them are ready at that point, but half of them are ready to get ready again. <laughs> in their making their lamps right, they've got those flasks of oil that they can use to refill and refresh their lamps. Now, notice that Jesus has the foolish bridesmaids asking for help from the wise bridesmaids. He's saying that they, they say to them, hey, uh, share some of that oil. With you. I mean, we know the bridegroom's on his way, right? It, it, you know, it's just, so we, he, he, the shout's already gone out. He's coming through the city. So surely we don't have that much long. You can, you can afford to give us a little bit of oil, right? And they refuse. Uh, again, Jesus has been very careful to use a word not to connote any moral connotation, but it's simply not prudent for them. It's not shrewd for them to waste the little bit that they have. They still don't know when the bridegroom is actually going to get there, because if he was delayed to start with, he could very easily be delayed between wherever he is now and here. So, you know, part of our reaction in our sort of, you know, good Christian culture would be to say something like, well, I mean, shouldn't they be loving and, and share their oil with the other foolish, you know, bridesmaids? I mean, wouldn't that be the sort of right and moral thing to do? But that's not Jesus' point. Um, it would be imprudent for them to do that. It wouldn't be very smart. Not if they wanted to stay ready. And so I guess there's a sort of hanging implication in the air that Jesus leaves with them that in this being ready for the kingdom, whatever that might mean, and we'll talk about it here in a minute, um, you're not expected to compromise your readiness to get somebody else ready. But that would not be prudent. That's not the way that Jesus has the parable set up. And I think that that's probably worth thinking about. Whatever it is that we decide is the getting ready and the keeping awake that Jesus talks about. It's not as if, oh, yeah, well, you know, I, 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 if helping somebody else makes me less ready, then that may not be the prudent or wise thing to do. I remember having conversations sometimes with some of my college students when I taught college. Um, and the interesting excuses that they would come up with for maybe not moral compromises, but imprudent activities. Uh, the one that always came up was the way that alcohol was treated. 
and the way that some people would say, well, you know, it's, it'll, it, I, I'm doing it because I'm, 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 I'm trying to, you know, witness to a lot of these people. So, you know, it's, it's fine for me to, you know, go to the bar with them because that helps me make a connection with them. And I got long lists of good but imprudent reasons why, well, this is okay, right? Um, but again, that, that subtle sense of, well, if you're just like them, then you don't have anything to offer them. And they're probably not going to ask you about what's different about you. So yeah, you might connect with them so well that they just bring you into their world and have very little interest in yours. That's the kind of thing that I think that Jesus was talking about. And there's other kinds of examples we can use. But the point is, everybody's not quite ready when the bridegroom finally shows up, but half of them are ready to be ready, and they get ready again, and they have everything they need to be ready again, and the others don't. And they refuse to share. They're like, nope, you better go get your own oil, because we don't know what's going on. So they leave. And of course, while they're gone, the bridegroom comes, the wedding parade is coming through town, the bridesmaids join with it, they all get to go to the party. And the door is shut. The opportunity is gone. And then when the latecomers do show up, they get this rather odd phrase, which Jesus is using very deliberately because he uses it elsewhere. I don't know you. Who are you people? Go away. That I don't know you kind of exclusion is one that Jesus has used before and will use again. And it talks about the lack of connection with God, regardless of the words that you say. Remember, I think we actually looked at the place where Jesus is like, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, didn't we do all these wonderful things in your name? And the Lord's response is, I don't know you. <laughs> I, I don't know you. Now, when we, we, we look at this parable, and so Jesus finishes it up by that saying, you know, keep awake. Because you don't know. Be ready. It's unknown. And again, the, the part of us that always wants to know, you know, right now, always be ready, right now. But there's that other part that says, what will it mean for me to be ready now that means being ready if there's a wind? Ready if there's a delay? And of course, we have that big ticket idea. We've got that second coming, rapture, whatever it is God does to bring human history to its end. And we want to be ready when it happens. And there is that very looming sense of judgment that if you are not ready when it happens, you're going to miss out. You're going to miss the party. Door's going to be locked. And the bridegroom will say, I don't, I don't recognize you people. I don't know you. And that's a little scary and a little sense, and that ought to say, well, yeah, I, I mean, I want to live my life ready. But if we scale down the advent of the kingdom to the more ordinary ways that Jesus is saying that the kingdom comes, then I think this parable gets into a little clearer focus. Because all of us want to be ready to respond to all the little tendrils of the kingdom that God has in front of us. Whatever little opportunity we have to be an agent of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy, to reach out with you know, God's hands and connect to the world, we, we want that to be a part of our life. But very often, we're not ready for that. We didn't plan for that. We weren't looking ahead so that we'd be ready to be ready when it happens. And that looks like a bunch of really different things. You know, I, I, I was thinking this morning, this, this hit me this morning about how not ready I was when I was stopped at a light and there was one of those gentlemen with a, you know, homeless sign there and I realized I don't, I don't have any cash on me. I don't really have any way that I could have offered and helped. I, I wasn't ready. I have no idea what that person might have done with the money, but that's not my job. You know, I don't want to be the kind of person that sees a need and says, eh, I want to be ready. And I wasn't. 
I was disappointed in myself. Because at the same time, I was, you know, always wanting to be aware of the tendrils that God is putting out there. You know, when I would frequently travel and be waiting in line to get on the plane, I'd be praying prayers like, okay, Lord, I have no idea who I'm going to sit with, but if you're doing anything in their life, I'd love to be a part of it. You know, make me attentive to whatever tendrils of conversation, whatever opportunities that are there. Sometimes it would happen, sometimes it would not, but I would want to be ready. And I was disappointed that I wasn't ready. I hadn't thought enough ahead. And it's not like I haven't driven that road for, what, eight months now? Not like I haven't seen homeless people there. I could have thought about it. I didn't. And I was disappointed that I wasn't ready to be ready. I just forgot to bring oil with my lamp. And so a kingdom opportunity passed by, and I missed it. Now, hopefully, God will remind me of that frequently enough that when I come back next week, I'll have a $5 bill in my wallet deliberately there so that I can be ready to be the kingdom whenever the kingdom pops up. It's those kinds of things that I think Jesus is really trying to focus on with this. The big ticket ones where we're supposed to be living our lives fundamentally oriented to the kingdom, the big ticket decisions, what my Catholic brothers and sisters called our fundamental option. Right? We're oriented more than anything else toward the kingdom. You know, that, that's not very controversial to us. But it's those little places where having oil in your lamp or not having oil in your lamp, having a flask of oil to put oil in your lamp may make the difference in whether or not I catch a glimpse of the kingdom when it's there or not. I try to keep a little bit of food uh, in my uh, room in the, at school. Uh, because I have students that don't eat regularly, and sometimes they'll come to me and they'll say, hey, do you have any ramen? Do you got any crackers? Um, and, uh, and once in a while, I remember to refresh my stash, and once in a while, I don't. And every time I forget to refresh my stash, I have a student that says, hey, do you have any ramen? And I'm like, oh, no, I don't. I'm sorry. No, okay, I got to make sure I get some oil for my lamp so that when the kingdom is moving in my direction, I'm, I'm ready. That requires a little bit more than just, I'm doing what I need to do now. I'm not, you know, lying. I'm not, you know, murdering anybody. I'm not doing any of those evil things that, you know, God would come back and smite me for. But imagining what the kingdom could look like in front of me, I wonder what would happen if. How would I be ready? I mean, because... The whole point of this parable is that the big ticket kingdom is the road. The big ticket kingdom isn't the thing that's happening right now. That the little things are far more likely to be the places where I'm going to encounter the coming of the kingdom. Where I'm going to be the one who gets to be Jesus' agent to bring the kingdom. Than the big ticket one. I'd like to think I'm ready for the big ticket ones. But I want to be ready for the little ones too. When Jesus says, be awake, I really think that's Jesus saying, be aware. Pay attention to what's going on in front of you. And if you know that there are some homeless people who are at lights on your way to church, be ready for them. If you know that there are students who you know, might not have eaten that day, I gave away my last bit of crackers this week because I had a student that met me in the hallway and says, hey, I haven't eaten in like a day and a half. Do you have anything? I was like, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure I replenish that cracker stash too early. But That's the thing that I think Jesus is after. What does it mean to be ready to be ready? What does it mean to orient not just the immediate responses, right, where somebody asks us and, you know, we're, we, we want to respond in kingdom ways and love and grace and mercy and all of that kind of stuff, but be prepared to be ready. Be prudent, ready to be ready when it comes. It might not come. I would rather be ready and not need it than need it and not be ready. Because I think that's how Jesus wants us to live into his kingdom. Not merely just responding in the moment, but imaginatively thinking about, okay, what, 
what might be going on and how might I be able to be ready for that in front of me? It's going to look different in all of our different worlds. But I think that's what the oil in the lamp is supposed to, the, the flask of oil is supposed to do. If there's a wait, if there's a delay, and so far there is, and still is, and still is, <laughs> we might expect that we might get a little bit more time. So how do I want to use it? How do I want to be ready for it? What does it mean for me in my particular circumstance when Jesus says, keep away? Because you never know the day or the hour when Jesus wants you to be the hand of the kingdom that comes knocking on someone else's door. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you are a loving and understanding and forgiving God. That you know our foolishness in how often we are so not ready. Sometimes not even awake enough to see the kingdom opportunities when they walk by us. Sometimes we see them, but we weren't ready to respond. You see that. You mourn that. You remind us of it. And you forgive us of it. Inviting us all the more to be more ready the next time. So, Lord, we want to be the kind of kingdom people that are ready. Whatever that means in our own individual lives, Lord, we want to listen to you and hear from you so that we know what readiness looks like in our particular world. So that we're not just looking to react when things come into our world, but we're out there seeking for places where we can be the kingdom. That we don't just pray, let your kingdom come. We want to earnestly look for the places where your kingdom can come through us. Lord, help us to be your ready people. Help us to be your awake people. And for as long as you tarry in the big ticket kingdom coming, help us to be ready for all the little pieces of the kingdom that you bring our way. We thank you and we praise you. And in your holy name we pray. Amen. If you'll stand and grab your hymnal, we have one last song for today, page 101, He Giveth More Grace. is
now this benediction. May you go from this place with God's grace and wisdom so that you know how to be ready for the kingdom when it crosses your path this week. Go in his grace and peace. Again, we invite you to Sunday school across the way uh, if you're here and if you brought any tithes and offerings, we have our little offering church there. Thank you for coming. We'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.